Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, we have reviews of Don't Worry Darling, Bandit on the Come Up. But before that is our fall TV preview. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, Aaron. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing swell, Amanda Sink. Hello, hello. And Troy Heinrichs. Is on the come up about craps or something? Because you're betting on the come? What? That's what you what do. It's did on the you com- just say? It's on the come. <laughs> you bet on the come line when you play craps. So I don't know if that oh, movie- Troy, what, what do you do with your life? What are you talking about, man? <laughs> you said you had a review on the come up, and I was wondering if it was about playing craps. It's about black culture and rap music. Cool. Glad we got the preview Jesus. ahead of time. The foreshadowing research is cool so uh, <laughs> wow i don't know where to go with that because i thought you were going somewhere else and i'm like i don't know what is happening are we still drinking from the last episode that could very well be possible <laughs> however you Aaron take it sounds like drunk. that's a you problem i was talking about craps which could also <laughs> imply something else too but <laughs> it's definitely a me problem yeah so everybody uh recovered from whatever that was we're good we can move on from that i think we're mm. fine and the question is are you you, you keep saying it's me, but I'm not so sure it is. I'm not so sure. Amanda, are you with me? I mean, I feel like you guys are talking about two separate things. I feel like you were just talking about making sure Aaron was making sure that we're okay moving past Troy's weird <laughs> situation. And I feel like Troy was talking about making sure we've all moved past Aaron's drunkness and survived it from the last episode. Right. Yeah. You guys are on two different pages. Okay. Or maybe we're on the same page because they could have been both things. You're in different books. Now we're all round back together. What's a book? That's where we are. I watch TV and movies. This isn't a book podcast. (laughs) You know, now they have audio books, which are like reading, but not. So then that's where John usually comes in and says, that's not reading. (laughs) Who am I to judge, man? You've judged plenty over your. (laughs) It's a podcast. It's literally your job here to judge. I mean, otherwise, what are you doing here? I'm not going to sit there and go after somebody for reading or not reading. I I, I only read one book, and then I listen which to the is, rest of them. Which is what? What's the, what's the one book? What to expect when you're expecting? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. That I was, cackled. That was pretty good. <laughs> oh, I'm impressed, Troy. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what? We're going to roll right into it because we we did – so much in our last episode so now we got to talk about some television man you're probably like well we're already in the fall yeah we are in the fall we you know what we had stuff with the 500th episode it was a lot and we wanted to cover that we had a great time with that but we still have fall tv to talk about there are a lot of new shows we're not really focusing so much on the returning ones because you know why you know what's out there you've either seen it or you haven't so we're talking about new shows that are coming out in fall 2022 from September through December, and what are the ones that have us the most excited? What I'm just now realizing is when I did the format, I actually put, well, I put September 21 through December. Okay, I put days, not years. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I'm just, I'm just. Are you still drunk? I think I am. It's been like two weeks, man. It takes a while to get out of my system. It does. (laughs) And technically, there is no more fall television season. So really, you should have said September 1st, because that's when meteorological fall happens. You and mm. you and I are uh, in a complete agreement with that because there is no more. Can we agree? Fall TV is not the same as it used to be. No. But people still, but people still have thousands of articles about fall television. Mm-hmm. Well, they've just like what to look forward to in the rest of 2022 sort of thing. Sure. I mean, it's like the rest of the year on TV, which yeah. is kind yeah. of what we're doing too. So it should really yeah. say coming in Q4. Do, are, do we agree though? Fall, like the actual start of television no longer really applies anymore except for network TV, which is kind of, you know, hanging by a thread. That's that's where the fall, quote unquote, fall season, I feel like is still in existence. And so some of the Netflix and Hulu and all of them, they still time a, a release announcement to that. Why like, hasn't that changed, though? Somebody, Troy, you're our TV expert by your your own accord. <laughs> do you? Why do you think t- uh, network television hasn't really changed their approach so that they have more exciting stuff happening in the summer? Because they have said, okay, we understand that we just gave you all these advertising pitches in May during what's called the upfronts. And those schedules of when those things will air have to be determined based on when people can pay their bills. Plus, hello, football. 
Um, and usually ad buys are based around like, I'm going to sell you a football spot as long as you also buy a Grey's Anatomy spot or a resident spot or mm. whatever. They kind of bundle that up with the football, both college and NFL. So that's one of the reasons they do it. The second reason is because the Emmys is like still the television pinnacle. So whenever the Emmys True. airs, the season technically starts the Monday after the Emmys airs, even though Fox tries to throw a couple the week before because obviously World Series interferes with the Fox fall schedule still. Okay, maybe he's the TV expert here by all accords. I don't know. I feel like the first point is like, kind of null yeah. and void, though. But like he, it was still all about network. It was a better answer but, than I had. But it was his question. He said, he said, why does the network still stick to a fall schedule? Okay. Well, but why haven't they changed that, though? Why haven't they tried to adopt a different model when they know streaming is so competitive with them now? I mean, Stranger Things had its biggest season ever, and that was in the middle of summer for a big for a big portion of it. Yeah, or even Cobra Kai coming out and dropping on like Labor Day weekend. It's like Labor Day, which used to be a, a weekend nobody watched anything ever. Yeah. Wow. Times have changed. I think it's I think it's tied to the Emmys for some reason. I don't know why, but that's always been like the nobody pinnacle, watches like, that anymore. That's for sure. That's for sure. Damn that. sure. I mean, I mean, here's here's how far off the map we've gone from fall TV. Is that everybody listening here probably knows that I used to do the spreadsheet where it was like this is everything I'm going to watch and get six TVOs mm -hmm. and DVRs and all that fun stuff. And I didn't even know that the fall TV season started last week. I didn't watch Survivor. I didn't watch The Resident. I didn't watch The Goldbergs. I didn't watch anything on network TV <gasps> I last week. The Resident? Yeah. For shame. And the thing is, is that it comes it. on Hulu the next day. And I should have just gone into my stuff and seen that it was there. I didn't even do that because I'm so busy watching other stuff that I didn't even have time to go to Hulu. Mm hmm. There's so much content. I mean, I want to go back and watch some other stuff. I want to rewatch some stuff. I don't have time for that. There's just no time for that. What are you going to do? Well, you know what? Let's start with our top five. We're each, we each have our top five new shows. Tell us what they are, when they're on, what network or streaming network they're on, and why the hell you want to watch them. Amanda, you start. Everybody remember to take a breath between your shows because we want to actually talk about them. Don't just uh, what? monologue about TV. Yeah, John, breaths are important to breathing. I prefer not to breathe at all. Oh my gosh, John, let's have a sidebar conversation. Can you do that for like five minutes? We'll see where we're at. Okay. Five minutes and he'll have brain damage. More so. How will you notice? <laughs> are we going to do all five at one time or are we going to go one by one each individually? That's actually in the format. But it is in the format. I know it's in the format, all... but for the people that don't know that we have a format in front of us, I was saying they're waiting for someone to ask the question because we always ask that question. <laughs> Okay, listener, are you actually waiting or are you yelling at the radio? We aren't waiting. We're Get waiting for you on. to start. <laughs> I'm going to start this off. Reasonable Doubt is coming to Hulu on September 27th. In this show, you'll judge Jack Stewart for her questionable ethics and wild interpretations of the law until you're the one in trouble. Then you'll see her for what she is, the most brilliant and fearless defense mm. attorney in Los Angeles who bucks the justice system at every chance she gets. And so I'm kind of looking forward to this one on Hulu. Uh, what do you guys think? So it's not the Rudy Giuliani documentary. Then. <laughs> no. <laughs> is there any doubt there? <laughs> oh, there is no reasonable doubt. Oh, my God. I love I love legal shows. Uh, I'll probably check it out at some point. I don't I don't know that this is really... I'm going to cut out episodes of the rings of power for it or anything, but, but I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to check it out. Well, and just to preface, mine are not in preferential order. They're in date order. Nobody cares. Okay. Not well, in the format though, so you know. but the listeners, you can't see the format. No, not in the format, but I'm, I'm scrolling <laughs> my guy. <laughs> Look, I procrastinated. Leave me Man, alone. We're just happy think... you got five shows from this year. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Uh, I had one that was like September 18th and I had it on there and I was like, God damn it, Aaron, you, September you 21st. Could have, you could have had that. Yeah. Literally, Troy didn't pay attention to the dates at all. So I was told two of the ones I had to cover and they had already started. So I just went with it. <laughs> um, I like I like Sorry. Lawyer Shores too. The thing that this one, I don't like the title. The title's making me go like, I don't know if I really want to listen to someone complain about. The reasonable doubt tells me it should have been a jury show. Like, it's the jury's mm. job ah. to come up with a reasonable doubt. Like, I think they could, this this might fail just because of the name. It's just, well, but the attorney has to provide the, the, attorney the context. The attorney to, has to give you the reason. Well, it's a defense attorney? or Yeah. So okay, they, yeah. The defense attorney has to provide the reasonable doubt, has to mm -hmm. illuminate that doubt. Mm -hmm. So I, it fits. 
I don't know, because I always yeah. thought it was like you're innocent until proven guilty. So it's really on the on the prosecutor to actually prove that you're no, guilty. It's the prosecution's. No. Um, it's their. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Yeah, no, it's not. It's re- reasonable doubt means that if you have reasonable doubt in the case, you cannot you cannot claim that somebody is guilty. So the prosecutor's job is to erase the re- reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. And the defense attorney's is to establish reasonable doubt. Right. Mm-hmm. And the jury just can't convict you if there is any reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. And also, I feel like we're just talking in a giant circle that no one gives a shit about. <laughs> yeah. Well, now people have a little but bit I've, of insight into the justice system. That's right. We are solving the justice system. Also, Paid. when you go to prison and you come out, you're supposed to get a second chance, world. Right. That's also how it's supposed they're to actually, work. They're actually- One semester of legal justice. Now, mm-hmm. Trying to change that life. Uh, and now I'm looking for sure. my uh, writing partner to submit a show based on the 12 Angry Men and make it a TV series. I think that would be fun. Would you call it reasonable, reasonable doubt? <laughs> Unreasonable doubt. Unreasonable doubt. There you go. Unreasonable doubt. I like that. You're welcome. No, it's actually going to be 11 angry men and one female, and the female is the one that actually becomes the foreman. (laughs) That's one thing I do like about this show is that it is a lady. It's a lady attorney. (laughs) I don't know. It it felt like that was sexist and also not sexist at all. I don't know which way that was. (laughs) I'm going to go sexist. (laughs) No, that's 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 exactly how Hollywood works. It's like, let's cast the one token woman so that we can say that we're not you know, putting just Ben in the in mm. the shows. Yeah, it was more of a dig at Hollywood, true. actually. That right. is true. All right. So moving on, The Watcher, which thankfully, thanks to the Tadum event, we have a date now. It's coming to Netflix on October 13th. The new limited series is about an anonymous letter writer whose terrifying messages to the owners of a home in Westfield, New Jersey, formed the basis of a viral investigative piece published by the, this magazine. Naomi Watts and Bobby Cannaval star as the occupants of 657 Boulevard. This looks really good. I'm I'm excited for it. I, I is it kind of it's kind of Ali, right? Isn't it? I don't it's know. Kind of Ali. Do I look like I pronounce anyway, names right? Here's what I will say. Okay, we're gonna call No, clearly Bobby. not, because it's actually called the To Doom event, as clearly <laughs> said by everybody that was in the commercial for it on Twitter. So That's dumb. I it's understand. Dumb. It's dumb. I understand. It's it's so- it sounds like to dumb, but it's pronounced to doom because that's how they said it in every person in the. Well, they're wrong. Well, I don't I care heard, if they're with Netflix. I heard Netflix. them say to dumb, but let's get back to my point. <laughs> so the concept to John's and Amanda's point sounds absolutely riveting, fascinating, and I love Naomi Watts. She's a talented actress. Amazing. I can't stand Bobby, whatever his name is. He's just the same guy in every damn movie, mm. and it's an annoying guy that I don't like. <laughs> But what if this maybe that's the intention? Yeah. What if this character is written to be that annoying guy? Then he plays. And he plays it really well. He, sure, but I also don't care. <laughs> I just I'm done with his character. It's and hey, maybe it's because he's he's with Rose Byrne, and I'm I'm really bitter about that. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just telling. That's, you. I'm going with that. It could be. Yes. It could be. Screw him for being tall and dark, handsome, and handsome, and have a voice that just like um, I'm Bobby Carnival or whatever he sounds like. Like he's got a deep, awesome voice. So screw him for all those things. I just like how he said his name like three different ways. That feels good to me. <laughs> yeah, Bobby Carnival. Yeah, Carnival. <laughs> Carnival. <laughs> uh, okay, my next one is 1899 coming to Netflix on November 17th. It's actually going to be available in multiple languages, like four or five different languages. So I, that's kind of I just cool. need the one. Just the one is fine. <laughs> yep. Immigrants on a steamship traveling from London to New York get caught up in a mysterious riddle after finding a second vessel adrift on the open sea. Ooh. And I did not want to insult anyone. The the cast is there. They have names that I cannot pronounce, and I did not want to insult them. You by mean like trying Cannibal to. or Cannibali? <laughs> you know what? It's <laughs> it's much worse than that. Seymour oh, Butts. Shame on you, because I would have given it a go. You guys know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> For entertainment purposes only. I think uh, this looks this, good. This feels like a Troy show. It totally has my name all over it. Well, it has my name on it because I I put it in the list and you didn't. I was just glad Netflix put its name on it because I was like, 1899, great, more Yellowstone. Awesome. <laughs> because <laughs> That's what we I need first. that. Hey, hey, that Yellowstone hey, prequel the, the 1880, was awesome. 1885 or whatever was actually really, really good. It was fantastic. I don't care. Good to know. What? I don't care. What? Have you even, okay, honest question. Have you ever even tried to look at it? And it's 1883, not 1883. 1883, sorry, yeah. Have I tr- have I tried to look? What is it on a bus? Then I can't watch it. 
<laughs> have you tried? Like I got to the to... bus and try to watch it like that. But like, did you check out eighteen twenty three on Paramount Plus? That's what I'm asking. What what part of I right? eighteen eighty three? I, I don't even know what, what? show it is. You can't anymore. even give me the <laughs> date right. What year is it? <laughs> You can't even get the date. I mean, right. that's all the uh, exploration. It's like I can't wait till fourteen ninety two comes out, and it's somehow look. tied into the main show. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till one BC. <laughs> that's what I can't wait for. I want to see just a couple of monkeys throwing rocks at each other. <laughs> <laughs> that was a shockingly was really, really good, good impression of a monkey. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous. That was <laughs> so, Amanda. Thank you for putting this show on my radar. I didn't even know. 1899 was coming out. Mm, Are you're we going to party like it's 1899? No, oh That's God. not a party I think I'm even invited to. Uh, no, you're <laughs> you're not. It's only a guy party and then hookers. Mm-hmm. It's guys and hookers. That's it. I can be a hooker. No, you can't. Does it pay? I don't want to be in a party with just guys and hookers. That sounds gross. That sounds like every bachelor party ever to exist. No, nope. that's not great. That's, I mean, th- maybe strippers, yes, but strippers are not hookers. You can... <sighs> you're right, you're right. Yeah, they're college students. Also, they're called sex workers <laughs> now. I realize Sorry. that in 1899 they weren't, but... Right, I'm talking from 1899. I don't know, I, why do you have to throw shame in my... I am just trying to make sure everything lines up to the time frame in which I am speaking of. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they weren't called hookers then either, but let's move on. They were ladies of the night. Yeah, it should matter. <laughs> ladies of the night? <laughs> hookers were the ones that were fishing in order to feed the ladies of the night. What? Wednesday. Wednesday is coming to Netflix on what? November 23rd. <laughs> Follows Wednesday <laughs> Adams' years as a student when she attempts to master her emerging psychic ability, thwart and solve the mystery that embroiled her parents. It's from Tim Burton and it stars Jenna Ortega. It looks amazing. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. But also Wednesday Adams. And she is starring as Wednesday. And I cannot wait for this. Christina Ritchie is supposed to be in here somewhere, mm-hmm. too. Who looks fantastic. Good for her. She has her whole life. Yep. <laughs> God bless her. I mean, I, I love Jenna and everything, but it's like Jenna's the whole reason. I mean, it is still Tim Burton, by the way. You know, Tim Burton is actually a pretty decent guy also. Just, he I, is, but, but you know, I was not, it's not like I'm a huge Adams Family fan. And so for me, my draw is to see Jenna Ortega in this role. I've always loved Wednesday Adams as a character, though. Mm-hmm. And so I, I also know that a lot of younger generations really <laughs> really connected with her for her darkness and which is kind of scary but uh because she was one step shy of a serial killer yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and everybody's obsessed with serial killers she was a days. serial killer <laughs> <laughs> true, true 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 all right my last one is the recruit which is also on netflix december 16th the new series is created by Alexi Hawley, who is known for creating shows like The Rookie and State of Affairs and also worked on Castle in the following. So that piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. So where's, why is Nathan Fillion not part of this? <laughs> I know, exactly. Tell me about it. Uh, he's gotten he's probably a little too old. They went for Noah Centennial from uh, Never Have I Ever. Hmm. And Never uh, Have I Ever Seen That. Wait, is that the wrong one? I don't know. I've never <laughs> seen it. Either. No, it's the wrong no, one. He's... It's the two all the boys I love. Uh... Two all the boys I've loved. Yeah, thank you. I'm like, it's one of those drama shows about love and angst. It's not a drama Boy, show. We are comedy. batting a thousand this week. <laughs> Just batting a thousand. I haven't loved any boys either. Also haven't seen 1847. <laughs> The story revolves around Noah, who plays a fledgling lawyer at the CIA who gets enmeshed in dangerous international power politics when a former asset threatens to expose the nature of the long-term relationship with the agency unless they exonerate her of a serious crime. Okay, so basically it's Jack Ryan meets the blacklist with a side of Doesn't sound like a bad time. Once again. He's paid to say the blacklist at least once an episode. Like. <laughs> for the record, Why don't you I, get paid for I just want to say, for question. the record, every time I would talk about Apple TV shows, like, oh, there's Troy with his Apple TV getting his commission and stuff. This is like she spent Netflix. Like, she just did the whole to doom event all on her own. <laughs> full, full disclosure. <laughs> she did. Full disclosure. Did there's the Hulu. There's Hulu on yeah, here. There's also. a Hulu f- thrown in for like, see, it's not all Netflix. There's one Hulu. But I also have some honorable Tok- mentions. A token streaming service. I have some honorable mentions that even include Amazon Freevee. Thank you very much. It just so happens that Netflix had better ones to choose from. And I can't help that. You guys also have a lot of the great ones. So 
because it's on freebie. That's why it's the reason it's better. And, and to be fair, I'm the one who's usually like, I am doing nothing but Netflix all the time. And true. I, and I true, didn't true, do true. that this time. We appreciate you, Amanda. You're welcome. I'm here to help. I like also, Netflix. we managed to cover the Tadum event, the to- <laughs> Tadum event. You're welcome. Tadum. Tadum. All right, John, you're up. All right, so my very first show that I'm excited to check out is Interview with a Vampire. Vampires are all the rage these days. Uh, so are toxic relationships. Uh, so this is uh, <laughs> Jesus. based on Anne Rice's best-selling novel, which spawned the 1994 movie uh, Tom Cruise flick, which I'm a little disappointed that they said Tom Cruise flick. Why couldn't they say Brad Pitt for like whatever the gothic horror like- drama which tells the love story uh and Im- immortality story between louis and lestat um and claudia so it's telling that story but a much b- deeper detail uh we've got jacob anderson sam reed bailey bass these are all people i've never heard of before but i'm still excited to see this uh it's uh, uh comes out october 2nd and it's on amc is that amc That's proper silly. or amc plus only AMC. It just says AMC. Okay, but you know you'll get the you, you'll be able to see it on AMC Plus without commercials. That's so. right. I'm kind of excited about this. I, I feel like I like the movie. You know, the movie was good. Yeah. I don't. I don't know the book at all. I only know the movie. So, you know, I don't think Tom, Tom Cruise was that great as was that. I know a lot of people loved him as that. I, I would agree. Amanda, I we, would agree with we you. We are not taking your opinion. <laughs> yeah. We, we don't, hey, I liked Maverick. We don't need to jump on this ship again. Uh, but yes, like I, I, I don't think Tom Cruise is a great Lestat, but it was as far as like a story is being told between those three characters. It was a good story. So, yeah, I will, I will check it out. They need something now that the Walking Dead universe is, is getting a little thinner. No one's feeding those, have, those. There's better options. Anymore. Remember when this channel used to be American movie classics? Remember that? What? Yeah. Yeah. We used to have classics day. on. Yeah. All right, so moving right along, The Midnight Club. It's based on Christopher Bike's book series. The drama follows the eight Midnight Club members who know they are fated to die soon. That's dark. Meeting a nightly, meeting nightly to tell scary stories to one another. That also seems dark. Uh, this is a uh, Mike. Flanagan. That's who I was thinking about because I didn't write that part <laughs> down. This is a Mike. This is one of those Mike Flanagan's uh, limited series that goes in the same line as everything else he's done for Netflix. Oh, by the way, it's Netflix. This is October second, seventh, seventh. I swear to God. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> trust him. He's right all the time. I cannot wait for this one. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, we all have an appreciation here for Mike Flanagan and his work, but I also think that. This is a little bit different from some of the other stuff he's been doing for Netflix, and I'm just on board with anything he does at this point. And it's a cool concept, right? It's eight mm-hmm. people that are about to die. Like, what are they going to do? How do they survive? It's kind of like it. Yeah, kind of. But or different. Final Final Destination or something. Or yeah, I, I like it a lot because Mike Flanagan has done nothing but good uh, by the stories that he's picking. This is something that to, uh, he has actually said has been. Um, very near and dear to his heart as far as the story has been uh it's concerned so uh him saying that gives me even more hope for it i i loved the, the first two stories that he told us the third one was good uh although there was a lot of talking like a lot of talking uh so i like to see what goes on here talking's okay usually john it's okay limited is also okay it's okay to just do <laughs> one season Right. Yeah. Just yeah. tell the story, get out. And if you got another story five years from now, great. Come on back five years from now. Flanagan right. gets that more than I think most, yes, he most does. writers and producers do. Yeah. 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 All right. So the next show I'm really excited about because I love the movie, both the Danish version and the American version of this movie were excellently, uh, excellent, excellently executed. Easy for you to say. He said he didn't like words. I didn't like words. This is why I don't talk that much. Uh, <laughs> John Avidi, you know, it's one of those Dutch names. I don't know. Linguist. Uh, His story from 2004, the novel was adapted into two different films, like I just mentioned. It's getting its serious treatment. The thriller centers around uh, on a father and a daughter's relationship, which changed 10 years earlier when she was turned into a vampire. Uh, She's uh, been the age 12 ever since. And again, yeah, this seems like awesome. It stars uh, Damian Bashir, Nick Nick Stahl, 
Anika no, no, Noni Rose, and it's going to be Showtime on October 9th. I love both of the movies. Yes. I love both of the movies. Yes. I do. And if this is a limited series, I'm in. It, I don't know how in the world they could go past one season because this kid's going to age. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's going to be it's going to be awkward if they try to do that. But if it's a limited series, I'm in. Although I will say everything I've seen about the series portion looks more like Last of Us than Let the Right One In. Right. I recall. Because it seems like that story they're going to tell is everything before she, um, before she her father dies in the in from the yeah. movies. So yeah. spoiler alert. But is it movies have been out for a long time? Right, so. yeah. right. Uh, then I'm I'm very excited to tell you about the English. It's a it's a Western drama set in 1890. <laughs> it's like seven years after that other series. Yeah. Nine years before. <laughs> Nine years before your series. Yeah. <laughs> right in the middle. Smack in the middle. <laughs> An English woman who's uh, – so a rich hoity-toity English woman who seeks revenge on the man responsible for her fu- her son's death. This is going to be starring uh, uh, Emily Blunt, and that's all you need to know. Amazon yep. Prime, November 11th. I'm looking forward to this one despite not being a Western fan typically. I I love her, and I think she can tackle any role that she's thrown into, so – uh, I love her, and she can tackle me anytime she wants to. <laughs> John might murder you, the Krasinski one. <laughs> right. He might. Or she would. She can probably kick his ass. She yeah. probably could. Right. There's no problem. I think, right. I think Aaron's wife might also kick his ass. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. But so- I, would, I would have tripped onto Emily Blunt, so I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> onto? I- into what? In- no, she would. Wait. Whoa. Hey, wait. Whoa. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Careful what you say. Plead the fifth. Get out of it while you can. All right. Finally, my last show that I'm excited about. (laughs) Thank you, John. Willow. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you more about this. This is based off the 1988 movie uh, and is a continuing story of of Warwick Davis's Willow. And it's going to be Disney Plus and November 3rd. I can't wait for more magic and sorcery because apparently I am not done with that. I think it, I'm going to pass on this one personally. You're a monster. I just I, know. I just want to know why John wrote off like all the teenagers and 20 year olds that are listening to our podcast by saying, I don't need to tell you anything about Willow. Maybe this is the first exposure they've had to Willow and they don't even know the, about the original show, John. If they this is if this is their first exposure, they can just leave now. Hey, 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 no, stay. No, stay. We welcome stay. all. We welcome stay. all. OK, fine. We're, we're mostly inclusive. <laughs> right. Most Savages. of us are fully inclusive. <laughs> but this is a continuation story of the original movie. Yes. Which will, I'm sure, become number one very quickly on Disney Plus as this gets Because closer. it's the one thing that's not Star Wars or Marvel. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> They've got that and Hocus Pocus. And that's Hocus literally Pocus. All that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you know, do you want, because I know obviously with this health situation, do you want Val Kilmer there in any way shape or form or do you think that would be too dis- too distracting based on his current i think it'd be too distracting, too in, distracting. His current, in his current health situation uh I, I don't expect him to wheel him out on a freaking dolly or something just to have him like <laughs> animime some movements at our general direction the poor guy <laughs> can't do a lot <laughs> however though i mean this would be like the mostly m- mostly inclusive yeah <laughs> mostly, mostly most of us are mostly inclusive however this would be I, an interesting thing because it is a world of magic and things of that nature so you could wheel him out where he's in a non-speaking type role and have like a great powerful voice come from somewhere else hmm. or they can just do him a favor and freeze him in a block of stone or something and it's just like see it's val kilmer he's here everybody and it's just him it's like statue. stuck like Han Solo for no good reason. Or some kind of statue. Some kind of backstory like, to it, right? Like this is right. the why the journey's happening because this hero got. But, but hey, his ex-wife is going to be here, so that's going to be awkward too. So like you know, she still looks great, by the way. She does. And where, why hasn't she been acting hardly at all in the last decade and a half? She was married to Val Kilmer. There's enough acting going on there. Oh, leave the poor guy alone today. Jesus. I don't think anyone's safe with me. <laughs> not today. Okay, not today. What do we say to the, the John, John of Death? <laughs> to the John, John of, of Death. Death. Not today, Satan. So, all right, Troy, I think it's your turn, isn't it? I believe so. 
So I did check out the first episode of Andor. It's a prequel to the Star Wars spinoff film Rogue One. <laughs> um, I'm actually interested in this because it all looks really, really good because this is like new Star Wars territory. I was a big fan of Rogue One. Not maybe the first 10, 15 minutes of the movie, but the rest of the movie was actually really fantastic. Uh, series Thief turned Rebel Spy, Cassian Andor. This is the five years leading up to the events of the film. Diego Luna reprises his role for this as Cassian, and it is now airing on Disney+. Plus. And you said you checked out some of it. Yeah, I did. I, th- I thought it was a good start. Okay. Should we mention real quick, James Earl Jones returning from, or retiring, sorry, from Darth Vader and selling his voice rights to Disney? Ah, oh, that makes me sad. Well, he's 152, so he can do whatever he wants at this point. And we already heard them grab Alec Guinness's voice for the movies, so... Yeah, they didn't even ask him if they could have his voice. They were just like, you know, he's dead. Let's just take it. That kind of goes into like the free reign thing at that point. But at least here, James Earl Jones is saying, oh, you have that cool technology where you can basically take everything I've said in my entire career and put it together to still make the voice of Darth Vader live on in infamy. I think that's cool that James Earl Jones had a, a say in that and how that got handled. I, d- I do, too. It's, it just concerns me that, uh, you know, this is the beginning. Of the machines taking over the earth. Just so you know. This is Westworld. This is how it started. The deep fakes are coming. Mm-hmm. The better deep fakes where you can't tell it's a deep fake. But I am I am glad that he had a say in it. I it also concerns me that Disney's never gonna let the Skywalkers go. Star Wars is always just gonna be a Skywalker show. And I'm kinda tired of that nostalgia callback every freaking show. Well, they first had to do the High Republic books and comics and stuff to see if people were interested in that era. And then mm-hmm. I'm sure they're going to pull from that eventually and do the High Republic at some point. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm curious about it. I'm not on board, but I'm curious about it. I, li- I like anything that adds that fills in the story at this point with Star Wars. It's like I'm, I'm looking forward to like Ahsoka when that comes out. There's just little pieces um, that are just out there that are like, yeah, what happened in this five year span or this five year span? Like the Mandalorian, right? No one thought like, who doesn't watch the Mandalorian? That's kind of like, who cares? But Mandalorian's doing really well because it's just interesting to see how the First Order comes to be in that wake of the Empire falling apart. It's a, it's an interesting time period to, to observe. Well, on the same token, Boba Fett was awful. Same time period. I, I didn't think Boba Fett was awful. I think you just had to be... You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. I, I don't it's like written, to use It was Aaron's written poorly, wrong, but the but... concepts were actually... It was interesting to see him like be with the Sam people and how he got his staff and everything. Like getting that It back wasn't. Story. No, it was not. It was never interesting. It was boring as shit. This is this is coming from a guy who thought five episodes of House of Dragons should have been compacted to 20 minutes. That whole four first five hours or four hours of Boba Fett was literally half a story from one episode would have covered everything he'd been through. This is coming from Nothing the guy happened. who says that those four hours of Boba Fett weren't worth it because you needed that backstory to understand who Boba Fett was. But yet no. just raves about House you, of Dragon and how boring those first four episodes Okay, were. time out. You don't actually get boba fett's backstory you get a new story of boba fett exactly so we've already got his backstory yeah, in the like movies. there's no there's no backstory that needs to be gotten for boba fett they actually did a they did the whole series a better service by sticking to the Man- mandalorian which i will not poo poo because i actually hate the fact that i enjoy the mandalorian um <laughs> mandalorian's great i've watched th- all three episodes that dropped of of andor um it's slow um it's it's not really to me that interesting the most interesting thing is at um adria arona's character or you know and i'm not sure if it's because i actually find her interesting or i just can't take my eyes off of her which are, it's possible it could be either one of those two things so it's not a show that i'm going to be sticking to i don't know why i sound so aggressive about it but that's just what it is i, I think this is actually the, the really great point i think this is something that is is the debate right now with the way streaming works versus, you know, you don't know how, like we're told this is the five years prior to the movie. So does that mean one year per season, half a year to 10 seasons, or is it all five years limited run, right? And I think not knowing where the end points are tells us this question of, is it too slow? Is it too quick? What's going to happen? I think we kind of judge stuff today without understanding what the big play is where I think people should just come out and be like, this is a three season show. Like just stick with it for 30 episodes and you're going to love it versus no. the un- versus the Absol- unknown. I'm just, I'm just saying Absolutely versus the not. unknown. 
If if the, if it takes thirty episodes for me to get interested, screw that show. That's no, it's, it's thirty episodes contained. It is a thirty hour movie. Done. You know, you what? still have you... to be interesting for every episode. Otherwise, what's the point of watching it? I don't want to watch something I'm not in, interested. Yeah, in. but 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 John's point of view was that it's too slow. Where you're like the House of Dragon, the slowness is actually better. So it's like sometimes no, the slowness that's not makes what sense. I'm saying. I'm saying it's not slow. I'm perfectly fine. I, I think it's perfectly paced. I have no problem with it. Boba Fett was inc- was horribly slow. The pacing was awful. It wasn't interesting throughout the hour. I find House of the Dragon interesting throughout the hour. That's the difference. Boba Fett was only interesting when a guy from a different show showed up. <laughs> and the de- and the deep fake for an entire episode. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well. Sure. All right, what's yeah. next? Sorry. Uh, we, reboot. We went on a side tangent. Reboot is about a dysfunctional cast of an early 2000s hit sitcom, Step Right Up. Who These guys must face their uh, unresolved issues and navigate supposed social media cancel culture when a young writer pitches a reboot of their show. It stars Keegan-Michael Key, Johnny Knoxville, and Rachel Bloom. Hulu has this, and it's airing right now. Um, it's interesting. It kind of feels like they're trying to pull on the 90210 reboot, where... They were kind of like themselves, but yet trying to reboot their show. But it's more comedy based versus drama based, and uh, yeah, it's it's not bad. It's okay. I I like that cast. That's a good cast. Yeah, yeah Rachel cast. Bloom is awesome. So that that would be enough to get me to watch it. But the surprise of the first week of the TV series season was uh, Quantum Leap over on mm. NBC. Set thirty years after Doctor Sam Beckett stepped into the Quantum Leap accelerator and vanished. This follows a new team that must restart the project, hoping to understand the mysteries behind the machine and its creator. Uh, it's airing right now on NBC and Hulu the next day. Uh, this was this is interesting. It's actually taking place in the same universe. So there's obviously that, oh, well, you know, maybe Scott Beck is going to show up. I don't know. Um, but Ziggy is back. Um, it, that's the interesting part of it. And the twist that they've done on this is that the the jumper, if you will, the traveler, uh, him and then the, the 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 person that they're working with, right? So Sam and Al in the original mm. film. Um, obviously the jumpers, the, Sam, and then Al is the one staying behind using the hologram technology. The Al character in this actually is um, the jumper's fiance. So not only is there a love triangle of how to get him back, there's also the scientific things about getting him back. But the added twist that they put to this is that obviously when they jumps the first time. They he loses his memory, so he doesn't even know the fiance is his fiance, and then he has to kind of work through that aspect of it. So it adds a whole other element to the show. And then the jump was actually done of his own accord. So you're trying to uncover why he made the jump with uh, outside of protocol. So there's a whole um, element to that. And Ernie Hudson is in this show as well. So if you're a big Ernie Hudson fan, um, he plays a pretty good Which general. So it's actually surprisingly the first episode was really really decent. I'm, I'm it was interesting. Yeah, I checked it out because I'm a big Quantum Leap fan. I'm like, all right, I got to see what what they did here. And and I do like that it wasn't a complete remake. Yeah, you know, it's it's actually an extension. And yeah, you can I go actually, back and watch the whole original Quantum Leap as well on Peacock, all five seasons. Yeah, I, last last summer I actually rewatched the entire se- series of quantum leap and uh i'm i'm interested to see what they do with this this series because quantum leap was way ahead of its time but there is no other time in the world in which they could have made that show and gotten away with a third of what they did on that show so it's uh it's it's going to be interesting to see how they how they can do something that's equally as impactful as the original show was uh, um but yet walk the line of what um um, of sensibilities are like today. Here's my one fear though, is that it's jumping back time travel from now into the past and it's on NBC. And we all know that NBC also had timeless, which was actually a really great show and a really great way to tell history that people were actually using that show in their classrooms um, to, to have conversations with students. And the fact that NBC canceled timeless after two seasons, I'm just nervous that this isn't going to be able to go the distance because anything related to time travel on NBC gets canceled. Well, the the reality is, is that if you get enough people watching, they won't get rid of it. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's necessarily because it has time travel. I think it just has to do with are people watching it or not yeah. enough. 
I, I watched the first couple of episodes for Timeless that first season, and uh, I got bored. So it happens. Yeah, it happens. I'd say that's usually why people stop watching TV shows. Nobody ever wants to admit it because they love it. Perfectly fine. You're, you're a fan. But the whole – the collective has to like it for it to stay on the air. And people are talking about this one, so it might have a better shot. Uh, next up, we got Friend of the Family. It tells the Herring's true story of the Broberg family whose daughter Jan was kidnapped multiple times over a period of years by a charismatic, obsessed family friend. The Brobergs, devoted to their faith, family, and community, were utterly unprepared for the sophisticated tactics their neighbor used to exploit their vulnerabilities, drive them apart, and turn their daughter against them. This is the story of how their lives were permanently altered and how they survived. Stars Jack Lacey, Anna Packin, Colin Hanks, and McKenna Grace. It's on October 6th, and it kicks off on Peacock. Yeah, this is a messed up story, so I'm interested to see what they do with it. But this whole story is a absolute like nightmare. Yeah, I knew about it from the the true crime aspect of it, right? You right. as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true and nutty. Oh God! Like there's a, a one point, um, he's sitting there convincing the, the girl that like she's being abducted by aliens. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's 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 the story. Okay, mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. it sounded interesting in in the cast. It but is wow. messed up, messed up. Like it will. By the time you, if you've heard like the actual events, I'm sure this will have the same effect. When it's over, you're just kind of going to look at everybody in your family and go, mm-hmm. "No, stay away from me, friends, everything. You're not going to have parties anymore. It's done." I mean, COVID kind of took a hit of that too. I doubled down. Yeah, I had more parties. <laughs> With, with upside down pineapples outside. <laughs> oh what? boy. Huh? That's something I learned new. I, I didn't do that. Go ahead, Troy. Sorry. Uh last one up is uh Tell Me Lies. Tell me sweet little Tell no, me sweet little lies. Uh Tell Me Lies. And this is kind of messed up too. It follows a tumultuous but intoxicating relationship as it unfolds over the course of eight years when Lucy Albright and Stephen DeMarco meet at college. They are then at that formative age when they seemingly mundane choices lead the way to irrecoverable consequences. Mm. Although their relationship begins like any typical campus romance, they quickly fall into an addictive entanglement that will permanently alter not only their lives, but the lives of everyone around them. Uh, it actually started airing already on Hulu and it stars Grace Van Patten and Jackson White. Um, it's kind of messed up. That's all I'm going to say. Am I the only one that hears entanglement and thinks somebody having sex with uh, somebody else's young friend? Yep. Oh, the entanglements. It's addictive entanglement. Just saying. I like how nobody said anything for a good second and a half after he said he clarified addicted entanglement. Addictive. Same difference. <laughs> Heard it both ways. And yeah, there's yeah. Uh, nothing on Apple Plus for me this time around because nobody's just Nobody cares until Severance comes back because Severance was awesome. I honestly uh, keep forgetting that Apple Plus is a thing until Ted Lasso comes back. You know that show about Ted Lasso? I mm, like that show. Yeah, that one mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. stars Ted Lasso. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good. Speaking Never of Ted of Lasso, it. though, uh, FIFA 23, for any video gamers out there, you could actually play AFC Richmond in the, in the, oh, in the latest FIFA. Oh, that's cool. Feels like you should always win. That's right. If you're playing against them. Because <laughs> they suck. All right, well, my f- my five shows. So the first one is uh, Tulsa King. It's it's New York Mafia Dwight the General Manfredi. He's played by Sylvester Stallone. He's released from prison after 25 years and exiled by his boss to set up shop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Realizing that his mob family might not have his best interests in mind, Dwight slowly builds a crew. It's on Paramount Plus, comes out November 13th, and was created by Yellowstone's Taylor Sheridan. Now, I actually don't like Yellowstone. Loved 1883, but I didn't like. I don't like Yellowstone. But uh, Sylvester Stallone obviously is a selling point to me. So I will check this out and to see him finally playing a mobster in a non-comedic role. I'm in. I think he's just in because he wants to hear "Ayo, Ayo." I, I do in Tulsa. In Tulsa, <laughs> in, a, sound different in, in, a, Tulsa? in a southern accent. I don't know. <laughs> Little get a little twang in it, little twang, and apparently I'm the only one excited to see this. That's too bad. I visited Tulsa, and it's not exciting. So well, he's going to make it exciting. I don't know about that. Yeah, he is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just recently went to Tulsa, and it was not exciting. Stallone seems like the thing that's actually turning me off from this concept because I'm like, oh mm-hmm. great, it's the Italian stallion. 
but guns instead of boxing gloves. No guns. He's not using guns on any of those. He's friends with the mob. There's going to be guns. They do other stuff. Yeah, they do other things. They take bats to knees and yeah. they throw <laughs> exactly. you they throw you in trash Shivya machines when they need or whatever to. they call the the trash machines with wheels on them. Um, yeah, yeah those- I'm getting much more of a Get Carter vibe. If you ever saw that movie with the remake with. Okay, well, I'm excited. I can't wait. November 13th. I'll be the only one watching it, but I'll be enjoying it, Sly. Uh, Guillermo de Toro's Cabinet of yeah. Curiosity, yes. a collection of the Oscar winning filmmakers' personally curated stories, described as both equally sophisticated and horrific. And Del Toro has confirmed he will introduce each episode. Comes out October 25th on Netflix, perfect for Halloween. You know, that's what I'm doing. So it's going to be like Hitchcock's old show, but with Del, T- Del Toro, right? Yeah, yeah, in a way. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. That works. That's a good way to do it. Different kind of horror. Probably be a lot more gory and fantasy, fable esque, right? His stories feel like more fables than anything. Nobody? Nobody? Okay. Um, the next one, The Best Man, The Final Chapters. Almost a decade after The Best Man Holiday, director and writer Malcolm D. Lee brings back Harper, who's played by Tay Diggs, Nia Long's Jordan, Morris Chestnut's Lance, and the rest of the franchise characters to end with the Peacock limited series, The Best Man, The Final Chapters. The new show is going to catch up with all the characters as they continue to evolve in the unpredictable stages of midlife crisis meets midlife renaissance. Specifically, it's going to pick up where the 2013 film left off with viewers learning that Quentin, who's played by Terrence Howard, is getting married. I cheated a little bit. It comes out December 22nd, which is like day after winter starts, whatever. I don't care. I love the first two movies. I'm a big fan of this series. I can't wait to see all these guys back together again. Where the hell did fall go? It was like, man, it's September 22nd. Winter's here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Technically speaking, fall come... was canceled because I went to Starbucks the other day and they were out of pumpkin. I don't think that constitutes fall being canceled. If there's no pumpkin, there is no fall. Just saying. What? You are such a basic white girl. You kind of, yeah, you kind of are. Yeah. Such a PSL bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. This is a, a quite a rarity for me that I'm actually going to be interested in something that's on a network. Sh- on network. I was really surprised but you picked this up and put it on your list. I thought you were going to throw it it's my got, way. It's got a lot of things I love. So it's called Alaska Daily. Recently disgraced reporter Eileen Fitzgerald, who's played by Hilary Swank, leaves her high-profile New York life behind to join a metro newspaper in Anchorage, Alaska, on a journey to find both personal and professional redemption. Comes out October 6th on ABC and was created by Tom McCarthy, who wrote Spotlight. I love journalism. Tom McCarthy is a great writer. Hilary Swank is a two-time Oscar winner. And it's Alaska, which I obviously love because I've been to twice in the last year and a half. I can't wait to see what they do with this. Now it's ABC, so I'm tempering expectations because, yeah. But I, I love journalism shows, and the talent behind it is great. Alaska's great. I can't. I want to see what they do with it. I'm very, very, very excited for this show. This is one that's on my probably top three. Get out of here for sure for the fall. Absolutely. 100%. Wow, you should have done your list earlier. I should have. <laughs> That's all right. As long as it's on here, mm-hmm. I really I'm excited to see them explore um, the indigenous women that are missing and, and all of the stories that go into it. And hopefully there's some awareness that can be brought to it with some solutions for us in terms of reality. But I also appreciate the aspect of journalism from from your front too, Aaron. So this was on my list originally. And then I was kind of like when I heard it was ABC, I went, oh, great. Big Sky 2.0. They're gonna put like back to back. I like Big Sky. I like Big Sky yeah, also. Suck it. I don't. I, I like Big Sky initially, and when the initial like mystery of it was done, it was kind of like this is not fun anymore. Okay. But yeah, Big Sky with reporters instead of police officers, private eyes. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that at all. But <laughs> as long as you feel like it does, I guess it feels like it's gonna be a Tom a Tom McCarthy wrote Spotlight. Have you ever seen Spotlight? Spotlight's great. I love Spotlight. I would assume it'd be more in that vein than a. Hyper dramatic ladies with guns show. That's how he use other things too, like wood chippers. <laughs> the next one, Baseball bat. my last one, The Peripheral, which is based on William Gibson's 2014 book of the same name. The novel focuses on Flynn and her brother Burton. Burton's a veteran of the United States Marine Corps 
elite haptic recon force. He's hired for a security job, which takes place in what he thinks is cyberspace. When Flynn temporarily takes his place, she witnesses something that may have been murder. The series set in the future when technology has subtly altered society and a woman discovers a secret connection to an alternate reality as well as a dark future of her, of her own is what the series explanation is. It's created by Westworld's Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan. You know things could go any which way, sparking from the source material, because, you know, that's what they've done with Westworld. I assume they're probably going to do that here, but this will hit Amazon Prime Video on October 21st, and it has Chloe Grace Moretz in the starring role. That's probably my only concern, because I haven't seen her pull off a highly dramatic role well, so other than Hit Girl. So I, I really hope they know what they're casting. She's pretty good in Greta. I don't think I saw Greta. Yeah, I check out credit. It's good. I wrote a review on it I'm, on the HollywoodOutsider.com. <laughs> okay. I'm a little hesitant for her as well, but it does sound like an interesting show. So I'm I'm willing to give it a chance, but I feel similarly to Aaron where she she can be hit or miss when it comes to the more dramatic acting. I thought she was really great in Shadow in the Cloud. So uh, I'm willing. I, w- I wanted to check this out because of that. I don't care who's in it. You said Lisa Joy and Jonathan with some spooky <laughs> stuff and sci-fi and alternate dimensions and cyber stuff. I'm like, yeah, this is up my alley. Let me ask you a question, Troy, because you and I, we do Beyond Westworld, which is a Westworld dedicated podcast, and you should check it out. Also but at the terms, <laughs> In terms of Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan, does it concern you that now this is their second show and it's once again not an original property? Like, they're not. They've got the, these TV deals that they've got both HBO and Prime Video, but it doesn't seem like they're coming up with anything original. I have no problem with people taking source material and actually turning it into something different. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying, are you concerned that they, maybe they? Uh, well, didn't Lisa Joy do the? Adapt? Wasn't um, reminiscence? Reminiscence, like a brand, a brand new yeah. concept. I mean, it pulls yeah, on. That- it pulls on. I mean, what? Whether you come up with something original, you're still pulling on source material, whether it's noir or Western or samurai or what have you. You're always pulling on something from the past. It's hard to create something brand, brand new. But yeah, if there's a book that gets optioned, it's like, great. Then just take the book and make something cool out of it. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I like, the, I like the cerebral think that Lisa and Jonathan bring to the table that really put us through Westworld because um, with Westworld, they really... I think it was one of our listeners on Westworld really broke down the whole Westworld uh, four seasons as the difference between like, it was really a, a, a judgment on what is free will, right? Does free will exist? Is free will really free? It was, it was a really great post. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm into when I watch television. Does it have those philosophical questions that you can ask yourself when you walk away? All right. Honorable mentions. Anybody? I've got a few. The first one is from Amazon Freebie. Don't judge me. Um, it's <laughs> called High School. Are you going to watch it with all those commercials? I don't know. We'll see. Oh. Okay, so it's called High School. It comes out October 14th. The reason I'm interested is because it's based on uh, the musicians Tegan and Sarah's memoir of the same name. And it's an eight-episode drama series that tells the story of the twins struggling to find their own identity. But it's also told through a 90s grunge backdrop. So... All of that sounds very intriguing to me, although I'm coming into it very cautiously optimistic. I still am looking forward to trying to check it out and see how it goes. Yeah, If the Te- first episode sucks, it sucks. Yeah, Tegan, Sarah, Grunge, that had me all interested. And then I saw it was on freebie and I was like, yeah, Ugh. yeah, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, the next one that I'm a little bit interested in is Welcome to Chippendales, coming to Hulu on November 22nd, yeah, yeah. mostly mm. just for Kumail Nanjiani. Is he naked? I hope so. No, uh, it's a limited series. <laughs> it's promoted as a true crime saga. Yeah, it what? is. It's a true it crime is. story. And it tells the story of Soman Steve Banerjee. I'm so sorry. An Indian immigrant who founded the Chippendales. And um, it's the greatest male stripping empire, if you don't know. But I'm curious to see how it goes. I know it also has Emily Gordon, which is Kamel's wife. And uh, she's a great writer. So I feel like the two of them being part of this, it, it may actually turn out being pretty good. 
Um, And then the last one is Blockbuster coming to Netflix on November 3rd. And it taps into nostalgia for a time when you had to go to a physical store to rent a movie. I miss these days. And it stars Randall Park and Melissa Fumero as two of the employees working at the last Blockbuster video store in America. It's obviously something nostalgic and close to our hearts, but I also really like the cast. So I hope it actually is like set in the town where the last Blockbuster actually was. Because like that would be interesting. I think it is. I thought. I could be wrong. Uh, that was my understanding, but... Again, um, I don't want to confirm without the It was research. like a small town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very. So this Chippendale thing, mm-hmm. that's true crime? Supposedly. It is, because the story behind how there's actually a murder involved in it, and the story how the Chippendales came about is got its own like amount of like bullshit that goes along that is all true crime related. But there is a murder, I believe, that happens. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm here for Camille, but I'm I'll stay for the I'll stay for the murder. Well, I'm here for the male stripping. And then I'm here for the murder. Uh, I want to mention the Winchesters, which tells the mm. epic mm. untold love story of how John Winchester met Mary Campbell and put it all in the line to not only save their love, but the entire world. Coming out October eleventh, as well as Walker Independence, uh, which follows Abby Walker, an affluent and tough minded Bostonian who's going out west and her husband's murdered and she's gonna try and find out who done it and those that comes out october 6 both from the cw i just want to mention them not because i want to see them but because jesus what are they doing at the cw <laughs> are, are you asking jesus yes okay. is he here can he can he answer me i would love to get his take on this all right so well, i make sure I, I, then i will throw in mine to, to tack onto that because i was going to add this to my list and then i saw it was on the cw and i'm like i can't i can't take that seriously but uh, it's called Family <laughs> Law, and it stars Victor Garber. Yes, Victor from the Orville oh, and Alias, Alias and uh, very much a theater person, is going to the CW, um, starring in the upcoming series first Family Law. Not his CW. Uh, which, uh, it's uh, former DC legend Tomorrow actor plays Harry in the new show, which originally premiered in Italy in July 2021 and in Canada in September 2021. Family Law is one of the many new syndicated series that are coming to the CW this year. So it's going to be interesting. It's a lawyer and recovering alcoholic, Abigail Bianchi, uh, played by Jewel um, Stady, and is struggling to put her career and family back together after hitting rock bottom. So it's going to be... Oh, uh, Jewel from Firefly is in this? Yep. Uh, okay. Victor Garber spent a lot of time on CW through shows like um, The Flash and Legends of Tomorrow and a few other of the Arrowverse stuff. He was on there for quite a while. Yeah, I'm not knocking well, that he's on. C- I'm just like, this is not a CW show. This is like a Fox show or an NBC show. Well, I think they're they're going through a rebranding phase, right? Yeah. Because they've gotten rid of everything except their Superman and Lois and the Flash show as, as, in terms of the DC. So they really are doing a whole rebuilding yeah, right now. Yeah, and the Flash is ending this year. So Thank God. Like, I feel like they should have just that. ended it. Because yeah. Riverdale ends this year, too. And then they should just end it and then close the CW down and just move it all to Paramount or something. Well, or well, HBO Max. To Paramount or when it goes to HBO Max. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I think they should have done is <laughs> canceled The Flash about a year and a half ago, had him make a Flash movie, and then we would have real a Flash real movie Flash to get movie. excited about. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. now we get all guilty when we would sit there and say, we want to go see this fl- new Flash movie coming out. Like, oh, exactly. Exactly. But do we want to see it? I mean, I yes. don't know that I yes. do anymore. I absolutely want to see it. I just wish I didn't want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Jackasses in it. Right. I want to oh. see it. I just don't want to feel guilty the entire time I'm watching it. It's going to happen. Why do you like cults? Wait, why do I ever like cults? Well, you do if you want to see the Flash movie. Right. Son of a bitch. And what he mentions is that Jared Leto's got his own cult. Yeah, but he does. I've He's I've mentioned that. I've know. literally mentioned it. Okay, well, just you then. <laughs> All right. Well, here's our listener top ten, the ones that people are most excited about from our Facebook group and Twitter, etc. Uh, number ten is East New York, which isn't one we haven't talked about, so I'll mention it. it comes out on CBS October second. Deputy Inspector Regina Haywood is the newly promoted boss of the 74th Precinct in East New York, a working-class neighborhood on the edge of Brooklyn in the midst of social upheaval and the early seeds of gentrification. With family ties to the area, Haywood is determined to deploy creative methods to protect her beloved community with the help of her officers and detectives. But first, aha, she has the daunting task of getting them on board, as some are skeptical of her promotion, and others resist the changes she is desperate to make. Regina has a vision. 
She and the squad of the 74th Precinct will not only serve the community, they'll also become part of it. Okay. All right. Uh, number nine, the Winchester. So people do want to see that. I don't get it, but <laughs> enjoy. Whatever. Cap- Captain of Curiosities, uh, Tulsa King. Wednesday is, uh, and then and running out number five is the Midnight Club. I'm surprised Wednesday is as low as it is. I'm surprised Cabinet of Curiosities is as low as it is. It's it's weird and different. and I know, but audience. Guillermo has a, a pretty good following. I'm surprised Jesus didn't show up when Aaron said his name. Yeah. Well, he did. He, he has just, better things to do. He didn't show up here. He right. showed up somewhere. Right. He's like, he's like Mickey Mouse at Disney World. You don't see him in the same place twice. Right. At the same time. Number four, Quantum Leap. Number three is Interview with the Vampire. Mm. Number two is Willow. Oh, sorry, John. Willow's not number one. Andor is. What? Andor's number one. Well, of course, it's Star Wars. So every time you see Star Wars, everybody gets really excited. I'm so over. I like, this is just making me somehow like Star Wars less. If I watch that show, and if I watch it, and I swear to God, if I hear any mention of any Skywalker or Vader, I'm out. I'm just done. Come up with something. You got a whole world. It's a galaxy. There's only <laughs> six people in it. I don't understand. Oh, if that's the case, then there's just a lot of incest happening to repopulate <laughs> these families. No, just everybody's connected. No matter where you go, apparently a Skywalker is going to pop up, and there's only like two or three of them. Why are they still popping up? I don't understand. It's just weird. They're obsessed. Obsessed. There were technically only three Skywalkers. Just for that. Well, they keep popping up at every single thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's only a handful. Why are they still showing up everywhere? Uh, or Solo. A pusa. Breathe. Anything returning that you're really excited about? I literally can't think of anything that I'm... Other than The Witcher, which I don't think is coming out this year. Crazy Anatomy. I'm super stoked. Get, Shut up! Give me some Ellen Pompeo. <laughs> oh, wait. She's not actually going to be, even be in this season for the most part, from what I understand. That's why really? I'm excited. Really? Yeah. God. She said, like, I'm basically not even going to be in the show. That's the dumbest the thing hell? I've ever heard. It, Whose it, anatomy is it? Right. <laughs> they just walk into the ocean, Meredith. Should have died last year with COVID. Uh, no, I'm not excited about Grey's Anatomy. But I am excited about the final eight episodes of the Mothership Supreme. Yes, The Walking Dead finally comes to an end starting in October. I can't wait to watch just the last episode. I'm not going to watch any of the rest of it, <laughs> but I'm going to watch the last episode um, just to see how it ends. Handmaid's Tale is also back. Um this one's going to surprise you, but since Netflix announced that Manifest is going to have a final season, I'm actually curious to like go back because I did enjoy Manifest initially, and I'm curious to go back and actually watch Manifest and see how this finishes out. I'm not. So enjoy that. Yeah. So- also, to Aaron's point, although The Witcher is not coming back till summer of 2023, the spinoff Blood Origin comes out Christmas, Ooh. December 25th. Oh, okay. It was part of the Tadum event. Announcements <laughs> should have watched it. Apparently, <laughs> should have. To damn. <laughs> um, I'm also actually really excited to see Big Shot season two and Mighty Duck season two and see where they take the shows. Okay. Oh, that- no, Josh Duhamel is on that. Mm-hmm. Is it not Josh Duhamel? No, that's probably is. I just like <laughs> saying it. <laughs> I really like to say it. I mean, now that I'm they like, now that they kind of like Jumal. got the gimmick out of the way for these two shows, it's like now how does it continue? That's kind of I'm interested to see where Dude, it goes. I have no interest in watching Mighty Ducks if Emilio Estevez isn't part of it. He is. Sorry, I just don't. No, he's not. First, first he's season he was. Yeah, but he's done now. Yeah. He's out because of some rule or some dispute they had. I don't know what it was, but it's too bad. He actually really wasn't just in go- much of the first season either, so and it worked just fine. I mean, I didn't watch it, but I'm just saying if I were to ever watch it, it would only be because Emilio Estevez was a big fan. Emilio! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Big Sky, I'm looking forward to it because Jensen Ackles is going to be in it this season. That might get me to actually go back and watch it to get to Jensen Eccles. He's good. He's good. Let's see. It was a lot of fun. Took out Ryan Philippe in the first episode. <laughs> yep. That was fun. Uh, I want to mention our show is independently funded. Therefore, all the expenses are from our own pockets. And Patreon helps fans support their favorite shows. If you want to help contribute and also get access to bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. Share your thoughts on this episode or anything else in our Facebook group. We're on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. Our website is thehollywoodoutsider.com. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for Fall TV. We've got a few reviews, but that's just for Amanda and I, so these two bitches can hit the road. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, bitches. (laughs) 
All right, now we're going to go to a couple of reviews here, and we're going to start with Don't Worry, Darling, which is about uh, a, a young musician who spit on a young up-and-coming actor <laughs> at a movie premiere. I yeah, that's what happened. That's the way I understand it. That's the way the uh, the media, the media. That's all they care about. That's all they What's seem the to movie? care about. What's the movie? There's a movie, and apparently there was a huge fight behind between Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh, which no one acknowledges except the media. The media just like, oh yeah, it's definitely a fight. Nobody else is saying it, but okay. So we've got Spitgate and we've got Pewgate, and also a movie. If you want to talk about, the yeah, movie. yeah. There, I mean, there's the film. There's that a film. Olivia yeah. Wilde has uh, directed, and it stars Florence Pugh and Harry Styles. Squee. For all the young girls. Pew pew. <laughs> in the 1950s, Alice and Jack live in the idealized community of Victory, an experimental company town that houses the men who work on a top secret project. While the husbands toil away, the wives get to enjoy the beauty, luxury, and debauchery of their seemingly perfect paradise. Oh, yeah. However, when cracks in her idyllic life begin to appear, exposing flashes of something sinister lurking below the surface, Alice can't help but question exactly what she's doing in victory. Me either. Till the end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. First of all, there are tons of bad reviews coming out for the film. In a in a very brief manner, do you feel like this is an actual representation of the film, or do you feel like people are kind of slamming the film in reviews more so because of the behind the scenes drama? No, I think I. I mean, I feel like uh, I get where some of the reviews are coming from. I haven't really read many of them, but I, I perused a couple, and they seem legitimate. There, it's a beautifully shot film, but the last act feels like it has no idea where it wants to go, and I think that's probably where most of the complaints come from. There's no complaints about Florence Pugh; her acting is phenomenal. It's just based on what I have witnessed. It's just about that final act, and I think there's a, there's a lot to that. So without giving anything away. No, I'm going to tell you the whole story. <laughs> no, these are spoiler free. Talk to us a little bit about what in the end doesn't, how it doesn't work by the end and a, a kind of what type of genre this film ends up being. Uh, if that doesn't spoil it. Okay. Well, I, <clears throat> okay. So it's, I, I feel like you can get a lot just from the trailer. The trailer probably tells you too much. I know, but a lot of people don't watch trailers. That's now. true. Good for you. Good for you. That's me. I'm that person. Well, I haven't know, watched the trailer. How do you know you want to see the movie? Because all you've heard about are the- Florence Pugh is all I need to know. That's true. What more do I need? It's, she's pretty phenomenal. <clears throat> okay. So there is a third act reveal as to, because you, I think you can tell just from the description, there's something else at play mm -hmm. here. There's something else going on. And Chris Pine's character very much is at the center of that. And what does that mean? Where is it going? Where is it headed? Well, the final act is the reveal of where it's going, where it's headed. And it, it feels very much like they have the idea of what they wanted to do and how they wanted it to roll, but had no idea how to end it. Mm. So as they careen towards the ending, it's kind of like build up, build up, build up, and then just kind of a whiff. You know how a lot of movies in this nature, you know, think think Matrix, think, think Usual Suspects, think things where they're building to that third act reveal mm -hmm. and, and where you go, holy shit. What just happened? And it leaves you with that whole just mind blown. Y your mind won't be blown here. I, I think it's probably going to be, okay, I get it. And then it's just kind of over. So too much too much dramatic tension building up to something that kind of falls flat. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So a I, little disappointing. The ending makes it disappointing. It's very good up until that point. That's too bad. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Harry Styles because you mentioned Chris Why? Pine and Florence Pugh. We already know they're great. What more do we need to know? Well, they're both great, right? Is that correct? They are, but on the same token, I kind of, I feel like I need to say this, right? Because it's driving me nuts. Okay. So I've seen all these box office reports, right? Like going in, because don't worry, darling, number one movie of the weekend did great. Everything else, good for them. I'm, I'm glad that they all have a hit collectively, everybody involved. But I feel like every box office report is talking about Harry Styles. And he's the reason why, because all of his, the Harry Styles fans are going are rushing out to see it. Just completely ignoring the lead star and the primary focus of the movie, who has been building quite a rapport of her own mm -hmm. for, for a few years now. Florence Pugh has really built 
a solid acting career, and she's an up-and-comer, and she's getting no credit. She's one of my favorite actresses working today. She's getting no credit for people coming out to the movie. Harry Styles is getting bad. all of it. And I will tell you, Harry Styles is fine. Well, he that's, did, that's he what didn't I do anything know. special. There's nothing special from Harry Styles. He did, And I like, what is it, Watermelon Sugar? Great song. I have no problem with Harry Styles. He didn't blow me away. He's just, he's there. He doesn't do anything. Chris Pine, like, will catch your attention. Chris Pine's phenomenal, as always, as he always is. But I felt like Harry Styles was just fine. Nothing special. But I special. feel like that's where the conversation is, right? So we we can anticipate. Only because Flo- they keep going there. But hold on. But Florence Pugh and, and Chris Pine, we, because they've built such a successful career for themselves, and, and Florence Pugh is still building her career and moving it forward and everything, I'm not taking away from that. But they are both incredibly well-known as being just great to watch, somebody to enjoy, and their talents Mm -hmm. are endless. So for me, why I want to know about Harry Styles is not because I'm a, a, I don't know what the term is, I'm not a style fanatic or whatever, but I do want to know as someone who transitions (laughs) from the music industry into the, the film industry, is this more just, I don't know, just some sort of like, tribute just because he's so famous and they wanted to bring him in and you know Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles and but is it more is he is he actually valid in having a lead role in this film and I don't I don't think he's bad I mean you know I don't think he's bad I think he definitely has charisma I mean he's the only good thing about Eternals so there's that (laughs) and you know I just it's not about him. I think is the most important part. He has another movie, you know, my my policeman or whatever that film that's coming out soon. That seems mm-hmm. like it's gonna be more of a uh, canvas for his performance. This is about Florence Pugh. It's all about her character. The entire movie revolves around her character. He is a supporting actor at best. I would not even call him a lead. Chris Pine, I would say, has more to do in the movie than really Florence. Even, okay, with, good. even with less screen time. He's more prominent. Everything he does is more prominent. His his role is his plays role a larger in the film tribute is to much it. more prominent. Yes, okay. he is. He is that cult leader essentially. I mean, he's the guy <laughs> in charge. He's the one. He's the charismatic guy. You know something's off about him, but you can't quite figure out what it is, and you're trying to understand. And then, then we do get you know more of Harry. Harry Styles gets to kind of change facets and put on a different hat as the film goes. Okay, and, you know, so he does get to act a little bit. I don't think it's anything that's like I wouldn't rave about it. I mean, he did fine. Fine. So not bad. Not okay. Fine. So really the film, even though a a lot of the media attention is on Harry Styles, um, probably just because of his notoriety. Unfortunately, the most famous pop star in the world. He is. He is. I get it. But Florence Pugh, this film is really just for her. She's acting her ass off. And which is funny because it doesn't seem like she's acknowledging this movie much, but she's acting around. I mean, off. at this point, I probably wouldn't either. Like, well, it's too much. Behind, whatever the behind the scenes drama is, I don't. I would want to. Yeah, I would want to be out of care. it too if I were her, though. Yeah, it, it's just it's it's a it's too bad because whatever the backstory is is kind of overshadowed the yeah. production, and I think they're kind of riding it a little too much. Too. I think they are. They're they're they're, they're leaning into especially it too much. with the Shia drama that came out. That that came out to really look make her kind of look bad. It seemed like. Um, well, I, I think it was really just to kind of correct the nature where she was. The narrative. Yeah, the narrative yeah. where the whole time it's been kind of a slam on Shia and his ability to be cooperative, and I imagine that that has taken a toll on his career even further than what's already taken a toll on it. I feel like he's done enough to his career that. Uh, but I get what you're saying. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, you if, get fair shakes across the board. Yeah, be if the you're case. gonna come sure. at me, I'm gonna say, wait a second, sure. wait a sure. second, Miss Ma'am. All right, so real briefly, let's just talk. Um, just one quick question about Olivia Wilde: Is this anything that's incredibly stand out for her? I know she's had some good, you know, she had a good film in the past, and so does this live up to that former film, or is she moving kind of in a to book smart? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of a director, I, I think she really showcases her abilities. I mean, she. I, here's here's my split on her, okay? I think as a director, she is talented. She has a vision. She has a good hold of her vision. The score that encompasses the film is, is very haunting, which really mm. kind of, you know, falls in line with Florence Pugh's character as she struggles to understand what kind of world is she in? What kind of, what world is this? Is this some kind of 
created utopia? What is going on in her existence? Because it's very Stepford Wives-esque, where these women are kind of conditioned, it seems, Mm -hmm. to act a certain way for their men. But is there more to the story? As were the 1950s. Yeah, which there there is a lot more to the story, but it's really hard to get into without spoiling it. I'm not going to do that. So visually, I think she she has it down. Um, She understands how a score complements a film. She has that down. She has an idea of how images can embellish and also um, just really bring a film to life. She uh, She's a good director. What I think it goes against her is I think she has a bad, a bad uh, take on how to sell her movie. Because <laughs> everything she's done PR-wise, I think it's been a mistake. She focuses too much on the sex scenes. They're very minor in the film. They're not that impressive. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's constantly going, I've heard this in multiple interviews where she talks about how they've never really, they don't really capture a woman's, um, r- relationship to sex fairly. It's always from the guy's perspective. I didn't see anything unique or different about how she captured a sex scene. There was nothing special about it. It was a sex scene. I, I didn't see anything really different from nine and a half weeks, really. So I don't know what she means by that. I think it's just a selling point and it doesn't, it's not really a good one. I don't think there's enough sex here to really work as a selling point. It's very minor. There's maybe two minutes total, whole film. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm I'm curious to check it out, particularly for that reason, just to see where that falls. If you know, as a woman, if that's something sure, that I can relate to sure. more, or if you're maybe just blind like most men, you're like, oh, we're both in this experience, and the woman's like, it's hold not, on, hold not, on, two minutes. I don't have, I didn't get to enjoy anything in this experience. What are you talking about? It's not so much that. It's just I I don't see anything different in how it's shot from any other film. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so if the full price of admission were ten dollars, what would you pay for it? Uh, I would I would pay six bucks. I think it's worth a viewing. It's not great. Okay. Like it, it's good. It's good. And and a lot of that has to do with the first two thirds because of the performance carry it. There is a wonderful scene be- between Florence Pugh and Chris Pine that is probably the the apex of the movie. I mean, it's fantastic. Mm. And that's acting. It has nothing to do with direction. That's all acting. But they bounce off each other wonderfully. You know. Both of them are well known for it. So that's yeah. don't worry, darling. Yeah, and nobody sang. So if you're going to have Harry Styles in your stupid movie and you're going to make it a big deal, sing, man. Let me know what people are so excited about. (laughs) He's not even on the soundtrack or anything. (laughs) He does some dance moves. (laughs) He does some dance moves in it. So you got that going. All right. All right. Let's talk about Bandit. Uh, After escaping his 18-month prison sentence for check fraud, Bandit's Gilbert Galvin Jr., who's played by Josh DeHommel, finds freedom amongst Canadians. Gilbert wants to do the the right thing and provide for himself in this newfound life. Unfortunately, even the 80s had rules on employment, which includes showing identification. One homeless man's ID and minus 22 bucks later, and Gilbert becomes Robert Whiteman. All good things must come to an end, including Robert's career as a popsicle salesman and a <laughs> rainbow vest. On the horizon for new opportunities to provide for he and his new love interest, Andrea Hudson, who's played by Alicia Cuthbert. Aw. Aw, 24 love. Love her. Robert heads west and finds out he's exceedingly good at one thing, robbing banks. Truly. Okay. All right. I love a good caper. The, is this more of a crime thriller or a comedy, upbeat crime thriller or comedy? What the hell's the tone here? Because I couldn't figure it out from a trailer. Well, with Josh, he he has such a level of charisma and wittiness that it's hard not to have moments of comedy for it. And so it's it's not this action-packed heist thriller that you may be anticipating like a lot of blockbusters make these days. And and so I kind of actually have an appreciation for it because of that. But it does have a lot of crime in it. And so if you're trying to see about a guy who's maybe understand the motives behind somebody who is going through 59 successful heists, perfect heists, I would say, you know, he is your guy to watch. You're going to follow the story about Robert and Andrea, and that's kind of the catalyst for him. And, and it's really just more of a character-driven story where we want to connect with Robert, a.k.a. Gilbert, and we want him to succeed, even if that means robbing these banks. And because of the time that it was set in, and this is a true story, it's um, it's kind of comedic to look back and say, wow, that was incredibly possible because of these flawed systems. And maybe he contributed to the change of that, right? But it is fun just from that standpoint. More than anything, you're going to be invested in the characters. Okay. And you also got Mel Gibson here as a... <laughs> you do. 
he's a loan shark. Is that right? Yeah. Is he good? Yeah, he is. He is. I mean, take aside any good or bad. So he owes him money, I assume, right? Well, he he actually goes to him and says, hey, like I have I can make a deal with you. And he starts it off and I won't tell you what happens, but he he takes an opportunity to showcase his talents to Mel Gibson. Mm. And from that moment, Mel Gibson's like, let's be partners. Let's do this. And and it escalates. Like sexual from, partners? No, not sexual partners. Um, well, see, it's things for, time for changing. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> but this this was the partnership where the professional partnership of let's continue robbing banks, but also let's see what's bigger than that together. All right. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so how good are – you talked about Josh a little bit. How's Alicia? Oh, amazing. You can't go bad with her. The thing that I really like about her – Unless there's a cougar nearby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the thing that I really like about Alicia is that she has this charisma that doesn't feel overwhelming. Like her presence brings you a little bit of joy, but it doesn't mean that she's always happy-go-lucky or, you know, like cheerful or anything like that. She's going through some real life situations, but she's a character that uh, a lot of us can connect to, male, female, non-binary, anything, Mm -hmm. because she is enduring such a struggle and and you're not really sure what's going to happen with their relationship if and when she finds out about his secret because it's something she doesn't know about for the majority of the relationship. Um, and so if it comes to that, what's going to happen to them? And so that's where the investment is really in the characters. It's about he has this secret from his relationship. And on the side of it, if he becomes unsuccessful at some point, that could be the demise of, of their lives together and everything that they're building. And so she really has this this beautiful take of a woman who is really supporting herself, not just supporting her man. And so in this time, I feel like that's really important for us to see that there are some of those independent and steadfast women who are also still loving and compassionate. Okay. So if $10 is the full price of mission, what do you get bandit? And is it fun? It is you, fun. Tell me it's it. fun. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. What's the your chemistry story? between between Josh and, and Alicia is really great. So I feel like that's your 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 reason for coming to see this movie. But I give it 550. And I'm going to say this is not a bad score. I feel like we always have to preface anytime it's it's a little above yeah, 5 or around yeah. 5. That means it's about an average film, above average actually if you look at the scale of 0 to 10. The problem that I had with it was the initial pacing. There's probably about 10 to 15 minutes that could have been shaved off if if done right, and it would have made things progress a little bit better. Fascinating. All right, last last movie review. We're going to talk about On the Come Up, which is on Paramount Plus right now. All right, so this one stars Sunna Lathan and Method Man. <laughs> Brie wants to be one of the greatest rappers of all time. Facing controversies and with an eviction notice staring down her family, Brie doesn't just want to make it. She has to make it. I kind of love the story just from hearing that. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about Brie, and I assume this is Sana's role? She No, she directed it. I said she also starred in it. Yeah, she stars in it as her mom. Oh. It's okay. Research isn't fun. I understand. That's all right. That's all right. Jamila Gray stars as Brie, and she's... The daughter of a deceased rapper who was, you know, essentially a gangster rapper. And he died based on his, I think, Tupac, mm-hmm. if Tupac had a daughter. That's that's the idea. And Method Man, he's known as Supreme. He's a producer that put her father in ah. onto the pop on the pop culture. Well, Bree's a gifted rapper in her own right. She's going through rap battles, think 8 Mile. There's even a reference to 8 Mile, which I appreciate. Really? So, yeah, yeah. That's there's, fun. There's a couple lyrics not devoted to 8 Mile. So- the fact that they acknowledge it, because there is very much a, a very similar story, you know, a up and coming rapper wants to be seen for what they're worth. But in this instance, it's not so much just trying to be seen as a rapper at all. It is somebody who is the daughter of a gangster rapper, and she has her own voice and her own thing that she wants to sell. Mm. And everybody wants her to be her dad in, in a lot of respects. So she's trying to... to put herself in the shoes of her father, but also, you know, take a different path, so to speak. And it's very difficult because the shortcut is do the same kind of, of rap that he did, you know, hard, go to the streets, do that. 
she can make an easy trip to, to success that way. But she wants, she wants to do it a different way. And her mom definitely wants her to do it a different way because her, it cost her father his life. And so does she face a lot of criticisms from others, um, maybe those within the industry and those who are interested to see where her career goes? Does she face that, that conflict of people saying, no, you should be like your dad. We're yes. expecting you to be like your dad. Th- and she has to yeah. battle that, too. That's what a lot of it is, because uh, Divine Joy Randolph plays uh, Aunt Pooh, who is really her manager for the beginning of the movie. And you remember she was in The Lost City. She's mm-hmm. she's. Great. She's hilarious in that. She's much more hardcore here. And she's great in her role. Like she's she's from the streets. You know, she's from that life and she wants to keep her out of that. She's trying to keep her away from Supreme because she's afraid Supreme will lead her back down that path. And, you know, while yeah, you can get fame, you can get rich, but at what cost is kind of what the concept of the movie is. So there's this this uh dichotomy because one party thinks he owes her. It's, you know, his his best friend's daughter. But he also has a certain idea of what a rapper should be, uh, where her family and, and her, to a lesser degree, believe that she should be going a different direction. So it's it's a constant conflict about what's the right course of action to take. How, how, how quick are you willing to sell yourself for fame? Okay, so I have to ask you this question, and it, it's a little bit of a personal opinion to the film. Sure. But you're not crazy about coming-of-age films. And this, oh, I hate them. Yeah, I don't hate of, them. I just I, they're all they're overrated. They're too, there's too many. They're too overdone, and they're usually the same story over and over and over. Do you yeah. feel like that there's something different here? Yeah, it's not really a coming of age story. It, it's more about, um, I mean, it is closer to the to Eight Mile story in a lot of respects. It's about a rapper on the come up. It's about what choices do, can she make. She has a choice to qu- a quick shortcut to fame, or take the long path, but it's more true to her character, and that's really what it's about. And any standout performances? Oh, Brie is great. Um, okay. Yeah, Jamila Gray is great. Sanaa Lathan is always great. I love her <laughs> in everything she does, so I have no problem with anything that she does. It's nice to see her take on the reins as a director, too, because, you know, unlike, you know, where Olivia Wilde was, is making it very much about the cinematography and the mm-hmm. visuals, I think Sanaa has a, a great appreciation for the story. Okay. And she, she has it figured out from start to finish. You know, she didn't, she didn't write it, but she understands the story she's telling and she does end it. You know, the ending feels complete. Like, all right, yeah, I'm with you. I understand. And there's a lot of uh, conflict that goes on back and forth. It's, it, it's a good film. Wonderful. So if mm. the full price of admission were $10, what would you give on the come up? $7. And I hope Lathan makes a lot more movies. Oh, yeah. Good. Yep. yep. Boom. And that's, uh, I think, going to do it for reviews this week. Although I do want to mention... Uh, Dahmer is on yes, Netflix. Yes, Dahmer. You should uh, definitely not watch that, but also watch but that. But you should probably, yeah, you should watch that. You should watch that and just but know it's a little more true than it needs to be. Maybe <laughs> not with dinner, though. <laughs> there are some scenes that I regretted it's, eating while I was watching. It's pretty intense. But I yeah. have seen um, that a lot of the actual victims in real life are having a hard time with this. And I think that's fair because... Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you really think about it, every time some new Dahmer thing comes out, their phone is getting blown yeah. up. Their you know their lives never get to really re-traumatize yeah, every single time. Every time. So, I mean, what I would ask people is definitely watch the show if you're if you're inclined because it's a fascinating story. I've always been fascinated by Dahmer because it didn't happen that far from me. It's literally right up right up the road, literally. Um, but on the same token, I would I would encourage anyone to not click on any articles talking about the survivors um not necessarily i mean that's exploiting the survivors that's the way i should say it you know if it's the ex- sure if it's the like survivor oh here's where they're at in their life like yeah, uh, we're trying to capture yeah, some where, stuff where are so and so now where mm-hmm. you know leave them leave them be you know, if they would if they do for an sure. interview that's different you know that's their story let them tell it but i just i feel really so bad for them because they've gone through hell and this is hell. not i'm not going to tell you anything about it but there is an episode that's dedicated to one of the victims and so I feel like the entire episode. So there's well, a lot they're of trying to say that they're telling this from the perspective of the victims. I don't agree with nah. that. I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> That's what Ryan Murphy and Evan Peters, who plays Dahmer in the uh-huh. show, Ryan Murphy's the producer and creator. That's what they keep saying. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that at all. I feel like it's very much kind of the typical serial killer. There are there are moments where you can where you're connecting very deeply with the victims, but it's not told from their perspective. Mm -mm. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't see the things that we see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's A lot that's of stuff not... where the victims are no longer present. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. And it's horrific. So be prepared. Well, there you go. We'll leave you on a happy note. It's not really It's, not happy. it's, it's not happy. It's horrible and tragic. I'm sorry. I tried. I tried. Damn it, people. Aaron. I, I... But uh, that's it. Okay. Well, everybody have a nice day. <laughs> and eat your vegetables. And not McDonald's. Go look that up online. Uh, I don't know. That's Dahmer McDonald's. We're done. You're welcome. Bye. Rate us and subscribe on your preferred podcast app. Please do. You can always find John's artwork on Insta and Twitter at Archon Draws. Amanda on Veronica's Marshmallows and Smirk and at Sink Into This. Troy at Troy Heinrichs and the Blacklist Exposed. And me, I'm presenting Hitchcock and at Aaron Smirks. And I hope everyone enjoyed episode 500 if you haven't seen, if you haven't heard it. And I think the video should be available now. So check that out. Thank you, John, for putting that together, by the way. No problem. And Troy for organizing the video no problem and amanda for being on the video. participating yeah. in the video <laughs> okay can we, and remember can the we, next can we suddenly answer john because we're not actually here i'm just curious well what? you you came back for the end oh. you yeah <laughs> who cares why do you gotta make it why do you gotta give me something else to edit <laughs> son of a bitch all right remember the next time you go to a theater buy popcorn <laughs> What did we say to not, the God of death? Is that today. what he said? But John, not today, Satan. John said, fuck off. Now, if you, the God of death shows up at your house and you're going to say, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that's the solution? I feel like that's the wrong answer. You should try to, you know, butter him up a little bit or her. That Give them different. biscuits. Hey, hey nobody's, what? nobody's ever on Who my doesn't side, like bread? man. Nobody's going to ever take my buttering up. I'm terrible at buttering things up. Fair enough. <laughs> Troy's all... The Game of Thrones and uh, the Dragon. And you, you hate the show, apparently. So I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't hate Game of Thrones. <laughs> I appreciated the history lesson. It just could have been done in a 10 minute Gladriel. It's not a history over. lesson. It's not real. It's a entertainment. <laughs> what are you doing, Amanda? I had a couple too many. I just realized I didn't count well. So I had like seven shows. You got honorable mentions, I guess. There you go. I deleted them already. It's too late. I was like, I, 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 <laughs> went in and I was like, I was like one, two, ninety nine, a hundred. <laughs> I want to see everything. <laughs>